How's it going YouTube? Crone here bringing you a video on volatility modeling today. So I have some returns here. I have four years worth of returns from the S&P 500 and what I'm about to do is fit a volatility model to it, specifically a GARCH 1-1 model. But the main goals here, we're going to start by analyzing the data. We'll talk a little bit about the predictability of volatility versus the predictability of returns. Then we're going to actually estimate our model and we'll plot the conditional volatility from the model against the actual returns. And finally, I'll talk about how to make sure that the model was an actual good fit for the data. Okay, so to start out here, let's just take a look at the data. I said that I've already read in the returns, and by these returns, I mean I literally just went to Yahoo Finance, got the adjusted close for the S&P 500 for this date range right here, January 2013 to the end of August 2017. And this gave me 1,176 total data points, or 1,175 returns. So let's see what those returns look like. Okay, so it looks pretty good. Now, when you create a volatility model, you have to make first an assumption about the mean. And there's many ways that you can handle this. If you have a time series where the mean is changing, meaning it's not stationary, then you can create a whole model for the mean as well. But if you look out across here, I think it's a reasonable assumption that the mean is not going to be changing over time and we can then assume essentially that this is a stationary process. Now for anyone who doesn't believe me, I did do, you can do augmented Dickey Fuller test on this which tests for stationary of the mean and this is indeed stationary. So we, were, we are just going to be concerned in this video with fitting a volatility model and not a mean model. So for what we're con uh, going to do here, I'm going to actually demean the whole data set. So let's start by doing that and we'll just take returns minus mean returns. So now let's just plot it again, but now the mean of the entire data set should be zero. So yes, looks good. And the next thing that we need to do for the beginning stages of our analysis here is we need to calculate squared returns. So let's say square rets for square returns is equal to just the returns squaring each element and we can run this okay it looks good now they're obviously going to look a bit different than the actual returns but we can plot these quick okay looks good just the regular returns squared so now the next big thing that we have to do here is create plots of the autocorrelation function and creating the autocorrelation function in MATLAB is very easy. I did copy and paste this ahead of time, so don't hate me for not typing it. But here we go. All I did is I'm creating a figure with two plots. It's going to be a two by one. And then third parameter here in subplot is just what plot uh, you're about to plot. We're about to plot the first one. So we're going to plot the autocorrelation function first of the returns. After that, our second plot is going to be the autocorrelation of the squared returns. So now let's go ahead and run this. And this looks good. So remember now, returns are on top and square returns are on the bottom. So what does this tell us? Remember that this is essentially measuring serial correlation. Do the past returns or do the past squared returns tell us anything about future returns? Is there any information we can derive from the past that will help us predict the future? Well, if you look at the returns, the plot on the top, the answer is no, right? You look out across here, we, uh, we charted 20 different lags, and I don't think any of these, maybe lag nine, lag nine, and lag 15 are barely significant. So, and really that's the general consensus, right? Because if we were able to figure out returns for the next day, then investing would be much easier, but short-term returns aren't easily predictable. So if we look at the square returns, however, remember that these squared returns now are essentially representing our variance. And if you think about this, well, what's the formula for variance? It's just the returns minus the mean squared, and then you sum over the time period, and then divide by the number of observations, right? So that makes sense because our mean is zero, so we're essentially squaring the return, and then if you want the variance over time period, you just essentially have to take the expected value over that time period. So using the return, squared returns makes sense, and we can see that the squared returns do have serial correlation. In fact, these have serial correlation consistently the whole way out to lag 11. And this is what you're hoping to see, right? If you're about to try to model volatility, you want to be able to look at the past and say, yes, the past does give me information about the future, which I'm probably going to use this volatility model to forecast. 
So now we've finished analyzing the data, so now let's kind of move on and actually start creating our Garch model here. In MATLAB, the code is essentially divided into three parts. The first part, we're just going to go ahead and specify what type of model we're using. And I will be using a Garch11, and you can specify this just by creating some variable, and we're going to use the Garch function. So we're saying, I want to create a Garch model, uh, the number of guard slags is just one, number of arch slags is just one, so guard one one. Now the second part is that we need to actually estimate the model and we can do this by just using the estimate function. So again, first line, there's actually no estimation here. Nothing's been done to interact with the data thus far. All we did was say we want to create guard one one model. Now we're going to say we've specified our model. I want you to now estimate the best possible guard one one model for my data. My data is just the returns, which we already took a look at. So now it's going to provide three outputs here. The first is the actual estimated models with the values for the parameters. Second is the parameter covariance matrix. And then third is log likelihood. Volatility models do not fit by least squares. They fit by maximizing log likelihood. So if you're wondering why we're getting a log likelihood output, that is why. So let's go ahead and run each of these lines individually and I'll show you what their output is. So this is the output from the actual Garch function. So it just says you've created a Garch11 conditional variance model. The distribution is assumed to be Gaussian. You will probably get better results if you assume a T distribution and all it is is just adding another parameter. You'll just add the distribution parameter and specify it to be a T distribution. And at this point, value of p is 1, value of q is 1. These aren't the coefficients, it's just essentially saying how many arch and guard slags we have. And at this point, the parameters have not been specified. They will be specified once we estimate. So now let's go ahead and run the estimate line. Okay, now it actually took the model we specified, applied it to the data, and estimated our parameters. So down below here, we have Garch11 conditional variance model. We see that again, that it is Gaussian. And now for the constant Garch1 and Arch1 lags, we have our actual parameters here under the value column, as well as the standard error and the T statistics. So now that we have our model estimated, let's go ahead and move on to actually inferring the model on the returns. So I know this seems a bit odd, but we use the returns to create the model. Now that we have the model created, we have to tell uh, the infer function what data we want to apply this model to because you might use one set of data to actually create the model and then a second set of data to apply the model to. So now we're going to use this infer function, say take our model that we just estimated, apply it to our returns, and then we're going to assign that into our conditional variance. Now while we're here, let's just go ahead and calculate conditional volatility as well. So convol equals square roots of conver. So now we have conditional variance and conditional volatility, which is really just the conditional standard deviation. So now I'm sure you're all eagerly awaiting to go ahead and plot this. So let's plot this and see what it ends up looking like. And I have this preloaded again, so we're creating a figure. I'm going to end up plotting the returns. I'm going to say hold on, meaning just don't start a new figure yet or new plots. We're going to also plot the conditional volatility on the same plot so that we can compare them. And then I have just a title and a legend here so that we can understand what's going on. So let's go ahead and plot this and take a look. Okay, so initially the model looks pretty good, right? because I'd say the biggest uh, volatility cluster is right around here, probably around observation 650, and it looks like the model tracks it very well. So, in fact, we can see during all the volatility clusters, our model increases in conditional volatility very nicely. So the model, at least doing a quick visual analysis, seems like it fits, uh, fits the data quite well. Okay, so at this point you might be saying, well, it's all good that it uh, looks like it fits the data, but how do we know statistically and how do we actually test it? So we're going to do that by computing something called the standardized residual. So we have our returns. We just built a model to capture the conditional volatility over our time period. And if we divide the returns by the conditional volatility, what should fall out is the standardized residual. And when you actually start creating your model, you're going to have to make some assumptions about this guy. And the typical assumption is that it's just 
independently identically distributed with mean zero and variance one. Sometimes you'll assume that it's normal, sometimes you'll assume that it's t distributed, but uh, essentially the way to now check if our model fits the data correctly is we analyze our assumptions regarding this guy. So we analyze the assumptions regarding the standardized residual. So let's go ahead now and just start testing some of the assumptions uh, regarding these standardized residuals. So the first big assumption, right, being that if we actually captured the volatility correctly, then there should be no serial, serial correlation in the standardized returns or the squared standardized returns. So let's calculate the squared standardized returns. So all I'm doing just standardized return squared. And now the next thing that I want to do is I want to actually plot the autocorrelation functions for both of these just like we did for the returns and the squared returns. Now if this all worked correctly and the model fit correctly then these standardized residuals should not be serially correlated and neither should and neither should these squared standardized residuals. So let's take a look and yes this looks great right because these are the actual standardized residuals no serial correlation there, and these are the squared standardized residuals, and certainly no serial correlation there either. Now in the real world, um, I would just use young box. I, I might glance at this, but it's going to be a quick glance, and then I'll just use young box test to verify. And if you're interested in young box tests, just go ahead and look, look it up on the MATLAB documentation. It's very easy, and you can just do a, run a statistical test to verify that there are indeed no serial correlation in either of those variables. So now let's take a look at the distribution of the standardized residual and also of the returns. Now I just paste a big block of code in here. I know this looks like a lot, but all it is is just I'm printing out. This is the jark bear test for standardized residuals. And we're essentially testing the standardized residuals as well as the returns for normality. And all we need to do is say JB test, put in whatever data we're testing, and it's going to spit out a p-value. It does spit out a decision as well but I'm just going to analyze the p-values here. And so I'm going to do this for the returns, print out the values, and do this for the standardized residuals as well. So let's go ahead and run this. And so this looks good. Um, I know there's a ton of errors going on here, but we don't need to worry about those too much because all it's just saying is p is less than the smallest tabulated value, but we ended up getting a p-value of 0.001 and a p-value of 0.001 for both the standardized and just the regular d-mean returns. So what this means is that there's a strong rejection of the assumption that it's normal. So ideally, if you're going to actually fit this model, you will go back refit using an assumption of t-distributed residuals rather than Gaussian distributed residuals which we used uh, in this fit. But so overall it does look better right because you can look at the statistics here and the statistic went from 353 to 193 so we are a bit better than we were before after we've actually divided by the standard deviation but uh, we would do much better if we actually used a t-distributed residual instead. But so that's the overall overview and that's the quick rundown of how to actually fit a Garch model in MATLAB and then plot everything, analyze, and make sure that the end product is kind of exactly what you're looking for in terms of getting rid of that serial correlation. So remember that it's really three core functions here. We have Garch, which is just specifying the model. We have Estimate, which actually calculates the parameters for the model based upon some data set, and then Infer finally says, take that model that we estimated and then assign it to some returns and calculate what the conditional variance would be based upon those returns. And the last thing I'll say here is that you can make some very easy modifications to this to get entirely different models. For example, if you want an exponential Garch model, all you have to do is want, add one E here, and now you have an exponential Garch model just using the E Garch function. If you want a GJR Garch model, again, it's just changing this function, and then I believe it's just GJR, and then you'll create a whole model using the GJR Garch model. So. It's similar procedure kind of regardless of the volatility model that you're using. You'll just have to maybe specify some more parameters along the way. But I, I enjoy modeling, so uh, if I can help you out along the way or you have any questions, feel free to let me know and I'll do my best to comment back. But good luck. Thanks for watching.